Welcome to the March 2015 episode of Risk Studio. In this section, we discuss key risk management concepts with an expert speaker. And today's expert speaker is David Tatum, who will be speaking to us from Australia. He is the executive director at Protect, where his team provides software, training, and consulting services around enterprise risk management. He's also the author of a book on operational risk titled A Short Guide to Operational Risk. I was introduced to David through a YouTube video where he was presenting about bowtie analysis at a conference. I was very impressed by how he was able to explain the bowtie analysis technique with practical and simple examples. I wanted my listeners to benefit from his experience with bowtie analysis and hence I invited him to join us for this month's episode and he kindly agreed. Bowtie analysis is one of the risk assessment techniques covered in ISO 31010. In this session, David will cover topics such as conducting the bowtie analysis, different risk management areas where bowtie analysis can be applied, and the pros and cons of the bowtie analysis technique. So let's get started. Hey, welcome, David, uh, to our podcast session today. Uh, so let me hand over to you to take us through uh, your take on uh, the bowtie analysis technique. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess in this uh, podcast, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on discussing the bowtie analysis as a technique for particularly operational risk management. And uh, certainly from an Australian perspective, we are seeing a much wider use of bowtie analysis across a much wider range of industries, which is probably a good place to start, is where did bowtie analysis come from? Um, it's a little bit like a history lesson, I believe, but uh, we see it uh, really emanating from the oil and gas industry, uh, particularly uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, where it was used quite extensively uh, in oil and gas, uh, particularly around analysing incidents. Um, and the purpose was really to have a technique that would be easy to roll out across a wider audience in order to understand exactly what had happened in an incident uh, because obviously the bow tie technique is aimed really at fully understanding the components that make up a risk um, rather than just calling a risk a very simple name. It's really an analysis tool to understand the components, tracing all the way back to the root cause of the risk through all of the various things that happen as the risk develops all the way through to the final impacts, impacts being measured against the objectives of the business or the business area that uh, the risk occurs in. So I guess the starting point for thinking about bow tie analysis is going back to what risk really is and the components of risk. And one way of looking at the uh, components of risk is to look at the life cycle of risk. And we see the life cycle of risk as really emanating from the initial cause of the risk. And this is really the starting point of when a risk starts developing. It's sometimes difficult to know exactly when that is, particularly in terms of our maybe lack of awareness uh, of when a risk cause uh, begins. Uh, but that would be you know, the earliest phase of when a risk starts developing. I've used the uh, analogy of a row of dominoes. And if the row of dominoes are sitting upwards and not one of them has fallen over, I would refer to this as a risk waiting to happen. Um, and it, yes, it, it hasn't happened, but it could, and we would call that a risk exposure. When the first domino falls, that's the cause of the risk, and it then dominoes into other, uh, other uh, uh, um, events, which we call risk events. Now, this is obviously lingo. People might have different lingo around these uh, parts of risk, uh, but this is what we refer to it. And finally, we have the risk impact. And what's important here is the risk impact is always or should be defined as an impact on the objectives of the organization or the area we are assessing. Uh, why? Because in ISO 31000 we simply define risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives and objectives being the final piece which is measured against impact. Okay, so the best way to perhaps uh, um, illustrate the bow tie principles is to take a simple example. And I've taken an example, I guess, for a rail company involving a train derailment. And uh, if I just read this through, a, um, the example is a train derailment at night has left a number of passengers with serious injuries and caused substantial damage to the train. The train derailed as rocks had fallen on the track. The train driver did not see the rocks soon enough as one train headlight was faulty and the driver was excessively tired from an 11 hour shift due to lack of drivers as a larger than normal number on sick leave with flu. 
Um, in addition, the steepness of the embankment meant that the injuries were higher as the train rolled down the embankment after it was derailed. The accident was reported in the press and the company's reputation as a result suffered. The rail company was also subject to regulatory fines due to compliance breaches and many passengers successfully sued for compensation. Following this, in the ensuing six months or so, train passengers' numbers fell markedly because obviously the fear of perhaps travelling on that rail company's trains. And that's just one example of, I guess, thousands of risks. And the idea here is to maybe stop thinking about risk as a single sentence, a single name, and to realise risk is really a series of things that occur which create what we refer to as a risk story. Now, in terms of laying out the risk story, and I always use the analogy of if we are writing a book, how would the book lay out? Now, the book would lay out in three sections, the first section being causes, the middle section being events, and the last section being impacts. But like with any uh, book, in each section of the book, there could be multiple chapters, each chapter being an individual cause, each chapter being individual events, and each chapter being individual impacts. Now, if we were to apply those principles to this story, we might get something along these lines. Firstly, what were the causes? Now, this is when we go back all the way to the beginning and ask what really started this off. And I would put to you as an example of it being the fact it was night time, rocks had fallen on a track, the headlight was faulty, people were sick, and also then the steepness of the embankment which led to the train rolling. Now if we started off with that, they would be the first dominoes that would fall. And as is typical with many operational risks, there's usually not one cause, there are usually multiple causes. Once those causes have occurred, they lead to additional things happening, which as I mentioned we refer to as events. Now these interim things that happen, referred to as events, would include the fact the train was derailed, there was an 11 hour shift, there was a lack of drivers, it was reported in the press, and so on. Finally, and the last section of the book being impacts, is when we trace this incident all the way through to how it's impacted the objectives of the rail company. Now we probably should have started off by defining the objectives, but we can probably make some assumptions. So I would suggest to you that maybe some of the typical objectives of a, tri a train company such as this would be such things as passenger safety. So serious injury would be an impact on that objective. Uh, uh, safeguarding physical assets damage to train. Reputation maintenance and uh, an enhancement, reputation damage. Obviously compliance requirements, regulatory fines. Uh, financial, which would cover then compensation, and also in addition to opportunity cost of lower sales in the future. So what we've done by doing that is then divide up the story into three sections. It's sometimes then easier to illustrate this story by rather than prose, we use a diagram. Now the starting point for the diagram is to say what would we probably call this story if we were to write it in a book? And I would suggest to you that it would probably be called a train derailment, which is where we start. What we then do is we trace back to the beginning of the book, i.e. root causes, by asking a simple question of, but why? And we ask the question, but why did the train derail? Because there were rocks on the track. We could then ask, but why are the rocks on track? And if the answer is, there just is, or it's outside of our influence, we would say it is the cause of the risk. Now in terms of this, I would argue that rocks on track would be outside of the influence of the uh, rail company, or I should say that rocks falling onto the track would be outside of the influence. Now that doesn't mean to say we cannot control that risk by putting rail guards, but we can't actually stop the rocks falling down somewhere along the track. So that would be considered one of the causes. In addition, the why did it derail? Because the rocks were not seen. Why were they not seen? Because the driver was fatigued, and in addition, it was night time. Why was it night time? I would suggest it just was, which is another cause. In addition, why was the driver for, um, why was the rocks not seen? Because the headlight was faulty. Why was the headlight faulty? Because it's a physical thing that can break, and sometimes physical things just break. Why was the driver fatigued? Because there was an 11 hour shift. Why? Because there was a lack of drivers. Why? Because there was employee sickness. Why do employees get sick? Well, sometimes they just get sick as part of being a member of the public. What we then do is we trace to the right hand side to impacts by asking, but what next? This then takes us down and we only stop when one or more of the objectives of the 
uh, rail company has been affected. So what happens next is the train rolled. Now sometimes the bow tie doesn't cleanly go from left to right because it sometimes shoots back to additional causes of why did it roll and I would argue that because there was a steep embankment. Why was there a steep embankment? There just was. That's part of the geography, part of the inherent risk environment. Once the train had rolled, what happened? It was reported in the press. In addition, there was a regulatory breach perhaps and it also led to passenger injury. Given that we've assumed that passenger safety is one of the objectives, passenger injury would be considered one of the impacts being an, a negative impact on one of the objectives. In addition, dollar compensation hitting the profit and loss objective, train damage, physical asset objective, reputation damage, directly obviously the reputation objective, reduced revenue, profit and loss objective, and finally dollar fines, profit and loss objective. Now by taking this approach to drawing this diagram, if we put an outline around this diagram, we now have the classic bow tie, and this is why we call this a bow tie analysis. Okay, that's that's a great example, David. Uh, so I, I have a couple of questions here. So in ISO 31000, uh, there is also reference to uh, something known as a risk source. Uh, so how, how would you see uh, that concept mapped onto this bow tie that would you go sort of left of the causes and then uh, identify the risk sources for each of those uh, blue uh, uh, causes you've identified? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I guess one of the things we find in risk management, as we all do, is uh, the risk of lingo. And uh, I guess there's so many different approaches globally. There's the standards. Even within Australia, we have dialects in each company. And trying to get a common uh, uh, lingo or common uh, uh, terminology is difficult. So if I refer to sources, we see this in kind of two main ways. One is the concept of what we refer to as either a source of the risk or a hazard. Now a typical example would here would be if we were using an example of a, a, a chemical spill. Mm -hmm. Now a chemical being stored on perhaps racking within a factory, we would see that as a hazard. Now I refer to that in ISO 31000 as the source of the risk which is the chemicals being stored uh, that potentially then could lead to a risk. The cause of the risk would then relate to the uh, chemicals in somehow falling off. Now that might then come from some kind of physical breakage in the storage uh, uh, um, of the uh, containers and that would be the cause of the risk. But because there's a source which is the hazard, the two of them come together and then obviously the bow tie develops with the chemicals hitting the ground and so on and so forth. So if I relate it to this example of the train derailment, if we then refer to sources, a source of the risk for me on the top would be geography of the terrain. Now the geography of the terrain is a source of the risk and if we get a bit more specific then, steep embankment starts moving into being a cause of the risk. Now to me one of the issues in risk management is when we try and isolate elements of risk into boxes we end up with grey areas between the boxes and I think this is a good example where I see quite a strong overlap between source and cause. But if I was to try and differentiate the, between the two, I actually see source of risk being slightly to the left hand side of causes and it's almost like the environment that exists that from there a cause of risk could occur. So geography, steep embankment, which is one of the causes. Yeah. In addition, the source of the risk to me under rocks on tracks is the geography, which would presumably be a slope next to the rail line, and we'd also have then loose rocks, which would be a source of the risk, leading to a cause being the rocks rolling onto the track. Now I feel I might have not explained that overly well and perhaps I find it a little bit difficult to explain but in summation I believe that sources and causes are very closely aligned but I always like to think that sources of risk are kind of the static environment yep. from which a cause emanates. I hope that helped. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's also the way I see uh, that root causes uh, and uh, the risk sources you know, are very tightly interrelated that yeah, maybe once you've identified the root causes you know, then you can sort of also uh, see uh, if that is tightly related with uh, any of the ri uh, risk sources uh, and understanding the root causes and risk sources then, you know, may, uh, may help you get a better understanding of that part uh, of the bow tie. Uh, 
The uh, second question I have, uh, David, is that uh, you have uh, a few events, uh, for example, between employee uh, sickness uh, cause and uh, the derailment, which in this case uh, is the main uh, event we have identified. So so what, what do you call those boxes like lack of drivers? Would you uh, say that is a cause that if I was uh, capturing uh, this risk into my risk register, uh, would I capture lack of drivers, the 11-hour shift, the driver fatigue as the causes uh, of uh, that event, or uh, I would capture them on the event uh, part of the risk register? No, another another great question. I guess the the view that I take here, and I guess we can get caught up in lingo, mm -hmm. is I tend to call the um, item in the middle of the bow tie the main event. Okay. Or some people call it the key event, and it's the center of your bow tie. I then see the items on the left between the main event and causes as what I refer to as interim events. Okay. On the right hand side, between the main event and impacts, as also interim events, and I've tried to illustrate on this slide by color coding them the same. Okay. So that's what I see them as everything in the middle is events, everything on the left is causes in blue, and everything on the right in red is impacts. The second part of this is then what do we do in terms of recording this in a risk register, which is also a, a great question. And one of the things that we've struggled with with our clients is what is the right balance between uh, excessive detail and granularity in a defining a risk in a risk register all the way to the other end of being too vague and high level, and it is a fine balance. So we always consider that the, red, the record in a risk register should be fit for purpose. And if we start at the top all the way to a high level down to a more granular level, this really is the four main techniques that we see. The first one is where you enter a risk into a risk register purely as the main event. Mm -hmm. So we would enter it as train derailment. Now, I would argue that is deficient because it misses so much of the elements of risk, i.e. the causes and the impacts. So I'm not a huge fan of that, but it is nice and easy. Okay. The second approach we see is where we enter in the main event the main cause and the main impact. So we well may illustrate this as saying it is a trail derailment caused by rocks on track leading to passenger injury. Now we often see that as being called a risk statement which is slightly better than the first one mm -hmm. but it does still miss out some of the other causes and the other impacts. The third method which is our favoured one because it's a nice balance between high level and detail is where we record the main event we record the all of the causes and we record all of the impacts. Now I call this really a bow tie, middle, beginning and end. Now with that said in a risk register, we also may then capture the interim events by way of a description in a free form field and that is the most common uh, way we see it being captured certainly in Australasia. Okay. The final one is when you do a full blown bow tie like we have on the screen here and where you record this in a separate file attached to the risk register uh, record. Now obviously you then consider what are the ways that you can capture this. There are uh, bow tie softwares out there that you can use. Uh, a typical one that we see though is to use mind maps which lend themselves quite nicely to this kind of description and we then enter the risk register in as maybe one of the uh, first three items that I mentioned together mm -hmm. with attaching a diagram such as the one on the screen which then shows everything including all interim events attached as a record to that register item and that's really the four methods that you can choose from. So maybe if we just think about the uh, main approach or the approach we can take in terms of a process to create a bow tie. Now there's no right way of doing this uh, but I'll give you a common way uh, and it may then be modified depending on the situation that you are in. So generally we always suggest that you start with the main event which is the item that you put in the middle of your diagram which becomes the center of your bow tie. So, so in this case, uh, David, are there any criteria or uh, guidance uh, you can provide uh, to our listeners in terms of uh, how would they identify that something is a main event and something is an interim event? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the the issue or the, the the way we suggest we do this, and maybe it's not a very technical answer, is we often find that the first thing that someone calls out as a risk tends to be the main event. It's the first thing that comes to mind when they think about a risk. 
and we don't therefore get very technical as to what the main event is. So if someone calls out something like train derailment, we put that in the middle of the bow tie. And as long as what they first call out as their short name for the risk is an event, we're happy to say that's the main event. So if we move into something like uh, you know something in the payments area of a company, we might say something like payment error, uh, staff absenteeism. So we generally don't spend too much technical time on saying, oh, well, that's not the main event, because to me, it's what the individual calls out. Now, what we generally find then is when they call it out, as long as we know it's an event, we're off and running, and then we can trace back to root cause and to the final impact. The last point I'd make is if you were to actually call out an event that was different from the one that I called out on my derailment example, you will actually end up with a very similar bow tie but perhaps one side of the bow tie might be slightly bigger than the other side of the bow tie, but in principle, you end up with pretty much the same result. So in summary, I don't get too caught up with the technical approach to what is the centre. I really do it from an intuitive perspective of what the individual I'm dealing with initially calls out. Yeah, and, and just to share, David, uh, something I have seen uh, a criteria being applied is uh, basically the main event is the uh, event which would result uh, directly, you know, soon after that event would be the impacts which will affect your business objectives. Uh, and I'm, I've seen sort of that criteria being applied. Would Is that is that something uh, y you find would be okay uh, for people to adapt that sort of criteria? It would. I personally haven't used that approach because, you know, just being intuitive seems to work. But when I think about it and uh, think about a lot of the bow tie analysis we've done, uh, your comment is actually quite true, but I've never actually thought about it in that way. So I guess overall that's not a bad piece of guidance to, uh, to, to put out there because I think that would work quite well. Okay, so once we start with the main event, um, you can either go right or left first, it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to go left first to root cause analysis. And we do that by asking, but why, until we identify the cause. So you keep on asking, but why, until we suggest the answer is, it just is. So for example, if we were to go back and say, why did someone make a payment error? And we say, human error. And we then say, why do humans make errors? Well, I would suggest that we're built that way. We just do make errors, and as a result, that would be a root cause because it just is. The second one is if the answer is outside of your influence. So if we were to trace it back to regulatory change, I would suggest that is a cause to the organisation, especially if you have no ability to carry out advocacy and lobbying to change the regulation. Now, it's... if. In the universe, there is a reason why legislation changes, but because it's not so inside our influence, we wouldn't go back that far because it's of no value for us in our risk assessment. So once we dance to those two, and it is just is, or it's outside of your influence, it is your root cause, and we suggest you stop there. If we then go the other way, we need to go back to impact now on the right-hand side, and we do that by asking, but what next, or but what then? And you keep on asking, but what then, until the answer is an impact on one or more of your objectives. And this is critically important. Whenever you do bow tie analysis in a department, in a company, you need to first of all identify what are the business objectives of that division, that business unit, that company, because this then defines when you will stop on the right hand side. Finally, and we suggest this is the way you do it, however, there are other ways to do it that we construct firstly the risk as an inherent risk bow tie, which means at this stage we do not consider controls. Now some people will in their bow tie start asking the, answering the question but why by starting to blame weak or failed or inadequate controls. A typical example of this would be if we go back and say but why was there a payment error and we say because of human error people will might then answer, well, why was the human error? Because of lack of training. Now that is a logical thought process, but we suggest that you do not do that because this bow tie, I believe, is more valuable being looked upon initially as an inherent risk. Now there is a big debate globally on the value of inherent risk, and I know ISO 31000 does not really mention inherent risk, 
and there is a school of thought that it doesn't have a lot of value. It's probably a subject of another podcast, but I disagree. I find inherent risk incredibly valuable, so I believe it is of, a, of high importance when we do risk management, and as a result, I like to first of all identify the bow tie at an inherent risk stage. What we then do, as we will do in a few minutes, is to then add controls on later. And rather than blaming a weak or poor control as a cause of the risk, I would argue that the risk is actually human error. Training, for example, is a control over human error, and we would assess weak or poor control training in terms of a weak or ineffective control, not as the cause of the risk. So, so David, in terms of uh, identifying uh, the causes, so, so you're asking us the question, uh, but why? Uh, from your experience, uh, how many times do you have to ask the why question to sort of get to the root cause? Is there a, is there a pattern or a general uh, sort of number in terms of how many times you need to ask that? Or it really depends on which event we are talking about? Um, from a personal experience, there is really no set rules for this, but that said, uh, this technique going back to root cause analysis is sometimes called the five whys. And so I guess in quick answer, uh, there's other people, not myself particularly, that says five whys will normally get you to the cause as a general rule, hence the technique going back to the left hand side sometimes being called the five whys. Now my experience is that isn't true. Sometimes we can ask the question why 20 times, sometimes it's three times. So I do not like to generalize as I think that can start creating restriction about a person's free thinking and perhaps could create a problem where they call out the cause too early, which is a problem when we do the bow tie. Okay. Uh, and, and one of the things I've also seen uh, in terms of causes is the uh, tendency to go and blame uh, or put the blame a, on a person or an individual. Uh, is, is this something uh, you have seen uh, in your experience also? And, you know, how, how do you sort of stay away from uh, putting, you know, an individual uh, as the as the cause uh, in, in the bow tie? Um, I have, but my personal view is that is an abuse of the technique. This is not a blame tool. It is a tool to really work out why something's happened for the purposes of understanding risk, awareness of risk, and most importantly, fixing our risk frameworks and our controls to make ourselves stronger. So the answer to your question is yes, I have seen it being used as a blame technique, particularly around where we have a, a, an impact, a financial impact, and it has to be shared amongst business units as to who is going to wear the impact and this tool is then used to assign blame but as I said before I see that as really an abuse and what it does it means that people then do not engage in the in the bow tie analysis because they think it will be used as a reprimand rather than a sister to improve so I agree with you but I do not like it being used for that purpose okay uh, and and in terms of uh, causes, uh, is there is there sort of a, a level of category uh, you would say we could use? I mean, for example, in financial services, uh, I have seen categories like people, process, technology, and external events. That is 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 that uh, something, or is there anything from your experience uh, you would recommend? What what categories of causes people could consider? Yeah, we'll briefly touch upon this uh, in a few minutes when we talk about uh, the construction of the bow tie, but in essence the answer is yes. So what we normally do is rather than create a risk register of, let's face it, maybe hundreds of different bow ties because each one could be considered slightly different, what we tend to do is to provide categories of each element of the bow tie being causes, events and impacts. And this then creates the libraries. So we expect to see in most frameworks a cause library, an event library, an impact library. Now in the cause library, particularly in financial services, but I think this is more general, is we generally say that the root of all evil, I shouldn't say evil because risk can be positive, but the root of all risk comes back to four things. And as you quite rightly said, we see them as failed inadequate processes, people, which we generally refer to as employees or internal people, uh, related causes, systems, which I call it the anything that can break risk, which would include software, 
hardware, but also any infrastructure, a light bulb blowing up, a leg falling off a chair. And finally, external, which is really anything external to the organization, things like acts of nature, change of regulation, the vendor uh, or supplier um, failure, third party failure, and so on. So I believe categories are very important. I think the four you called out as the level one category is very important. The issue you need to determine when you create a category of, say, causes is how granular do you get? We generally find that for causes, people generally go down to two levels. So the first level is the four that you suggested, and then they might break out a second level below that, which might end up with around 40 causes or thereabouts as a general rule of thumb. Okay, and, and maybe one more uh, question, David, uh, before we proceed. So w what would be your uh, guidance or what has been your experience where uh, the main event uh, may be the same, uh, but where there could be completely different set of causes? And one example is, uh, let's say, mis-selling, you know, where in one case, uh, maybe that the salespeople in an in a, in a insurance organization are intentionally mis-selling the wrong insurance products to their customer. Uh, so in that case, the causes and the controls and the impacts, you know, would be very different than uh, another case where uh, the mis-selling happened because of some business process flaw where uh, there were call center employees uh, selling car insurance policy and they have to read out the terms and conditions of the policy uh, as part of the sales process and somebody gave them a wrong printout. So they were reading out the, the wrong terms and condition. So in both cases, the event is the same that we have missold uh, the uh, a, 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 we have missold insurance product to our customers, but the the universe of causes is completely different. That would you say that that would be two bow ties, or would that be one bow tie, and then you would just create uh, two separate sets of causes, one for the intentional aspect of that event, and one for the uh, business process error aspect of that event. Yeah, another another great question. Um, my view on this is 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 kind of what I call fit for purpose. So if we were to go with mis-selling as the centre of the bow tie, and we started our root cause analysis, we would end up going down multiple pathways. And you've created two. One is intentional, and the other one is, I guess, by uh, by error. Now, if you started to do that, and you realised that the left hand side of the bow tie was becoming rather large. We, um, I use generally the term the clown's bow tie, which is an extremely large bow tie. And when the bow tie becomes large, it sometimes can become unwieldy. And you have to use, I guess, your judgment to say, is this bow tie being too big to manage? Mm -hmm. If it then becomes too big to manage, we suggest you split it into two, and you would do it based on exactly what you said, and you'd have one pathways that may be intentional mis-selling, and the other way, accidental mis-selling, and you would then change the center of the bow tie by saying exactly that and create two bow ties. Now, it's always a balance because if you start doing that, you end up then by death by bow ties and having too much analysis going on, um, and it is a judgment call as to whether you amalgamate or you split. So I can't give you a rule of thumb except to say we use the concept of the clown's bow tie, and when it becomes a clown's bow tie, it's perhaps too big, and you should be consider splitting it into two smaller ones. So that's probably the best guidance that I can give you. Okay, now one of the things I wanted to mention is what we see as the most common errors in constructing the bow tie. The first most common error is adults particularly don't ask enough but whys. And I'm not sure why this is, but what I always say to people to overcome this problem is to remember when you were a child because children, as we all know who've had them, have an incredible ability to keep on asking but why. I would like to say that even when you say to your children, it is just this way, it, is, it, it just is, they will often say, but why is it just is? And that's the kind of rigour that we as adults should have when we do bow tie analysis because the typical adult will just call out the cause way too early and this is a real problem because you've missed a big part of the left-hand side of the risk and as we'll see later, this is often the best place to control risk is at its source through preventive controls and proactive risk management rather than reactive. The second common problem we have is we often miss out interim events. And what that means is we do quantum leaps between different parts of the bow tie. 
Now this can be a problem when we start using the bow tie uh, in terms of our risk management because some of those interim events might be extremely valuable. A little bit later we'll talk about using the bow tie to identify key risk indicators and if you miss out an interim event that could be giving off indicators you might completely miss that. The analogy I always use for this, and uh, the, the answer to sort of solving this is against be childlike and I always use the illustration of um, I have a couple of children and uh, I can remember back when my daughter was five or six years old, uh, bedtime was eight o'clock and she would then say I need to get a book and you need to read me a story and it was like three minutes to eight and I would think no we don't have the time but go and get it. She would always bring to me the biggest book in her bookshelf and I'd look at it and realize that if I read it all it would be you know, an hour or two hours worth. So I would read the first chapter and then we would obviously distract the child to look out the window at the bird outside and then I'd flick over to chapter number five and I'm sure any parent knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now my child is very good at saying I'm sorry dad you've missed out the part where the fairy is captured by and that is saying to me dad you've done a quantum leap between events as a result I want you to do all the chapters. So this, the, the important thing is here is when we create a bow tie you don't miss out any interim steps otherwise you've missed potentially very important information for when we use the bow tie later. And the final one is the risk of or the, the the error of identifying failed or inadequate trials as a cause or an event. And as I mentioned before, we suggest you build the bow tie initially as an inherent risk bow tie rather than blaming failed or weak controls as a cause. They are exactly that, they are a failed or weak control which comes later. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, the concept of building bow ties into an overall risk management framework. Now, most people that are doing bow ties, uh, obviously, into part of an enterprise risk management process, we usually have some kind of system or software. And obviously, creating bow ties, we would like to have consistency. Now, consistency comes from linking the events, the causes, and the impacts that we use to a common set of risk libraries. On the left hand side we have our cause libraries which we already discussed earlier in the podcast. We most commonly find two levels of causes, level one as you mentioned the four and then moving down to level two. We then move to risk events. Now in financial services as you mentioned before uh, we may be aware that we have seven main risk events being what we call the Basel categories including internal fraud, external fraud and so on and that becomes our level one events whether we like them or not. Then we generally see the le level two events and level three events in a typical financial institution and that might create somewhere in the region of 200 to 300 level three events. Finally on the right hand side the impact library. Now the impact library is not so much a library as a list. Why is it a list? Because the impact should be measured against our objectives and most organizations at the most strategic level maybe only have five, six or seven strategic objectives. So we typically see for most organization the impacts being financial, reputation, customer impact, compliance breach and so on and that way we now have our standard libraries against which everything can be linked. Now the use of the bow tie. At the highest level the use of the bow tie can be used or the bow tie can be used for looking at both potential events and actual risk stories that have happened, often known as incidents. Now, if we think about that from a potential event, this would be the typical bow tie. Now, you mentioned earlier about mis-selling, and you said that there were a number of pathways that could create mis-selling. You mentioned two, which was deliberate, and then but through error. Now, that would then create multiple paths on the left-hand side, and now we then get the typical bow tie on the left hand side. That would then lead to perhaps multiple impact, which is what most risks do, which is a typical expanded side on the right hand side. Now we would use that then to understand potential risks that could happen. We also can use a bow tie analysis for analysing an actual incident that has happened, and obviously this is incident management. An example there is when we look at an actual incident, what actually happened was tracing those pathways and that is then used in incident management. So to summarize, we can use the bow tie to understand future potential risks that may not have yet happened, but also to analyze incidents that have happened.
And uh, for actual stories, David, so, uh, so, so that's where you have actual incident information. So you can use that to uh, create your bow tie uh, for your potential stories or for your future uh, potential events. Uh, what is the practice you've seen that uh, when people want to start identifying uh, the bow tie or start creating the bow tie, do they put the narrative sort of on a piece of paper first, like you had, uh, uh, you started with the train derailment story where you just put it as a text and then you start hi highlighting what the causes and events and impacts are? Or do you just get into a workshop and then you just start creating the bow tie based on what people uh, start discussing in that workshop? What What is a good start uh, before you start creating your bow tie diagram in terms of getting all the aspects, you know, uh, on, on a piece of paper. Yeah, and I guess it's a good uh, opportunity to be very practical here about how do we construct the bow tie. At the most simple level, it requires a whiteboard and a pen. Um, we, as a firm and with our clients, if an incident occurs, the first thing we tend to run to uh, is the whiteboard and a pen, and we then start with the middle of the bow tie, and we then develop, based on our knowledge of that incident, the bow tie with as much detail as we can. Now that is sometimes also done, and I've seen it done at a very simple level with just sticky uh, labels, and then you move the labels around and create your storyline, and then you can start calling them the root cause, the events, and the impacts. So at the most basic level, in terms of an incident that has occurred, is calling the people in around a workshop and really just getting on a whiteboard, creating based on knowledge you have, the bow tie. We then keep it running, and as we learn more and more about that incident, we can expand the bow tie all the way to its completion. The best example I always give with this is the show Air Crash Investigation. Now, Air Crash Investigators are some of the best bow tie analyzers out there, and usually in that show we always get a picture of the large whiteboard, generally in the hangar, which has then analyzed all the information they've known, tracing back to root cause and down to impact. So that's the kind of main way we see it. In addition then, when we talk about future potential risks, we often then dovetail the knowledge we have of past incidents to try and better understand the future. All I would say is I tend to find the bow ties created by an actual incident much more detailed than ones that are created based on future potential events. And I guess the reason is we have facts about exactly what did happen rather than theorizing about what might have happened. Yeah, no, so I, I, I like uh, the technique of actually getting people to write about, yeah, even the potential that, yeah, that requires a little bit of hard work that you need to see uh, what the future event and causes and impacts would be. Uh, but I'll, I'll try that technique next time where, you know, I will get people to write all that and bring that into the workshop rather than uh, starting, you know, with uh, just what they have in the head uh, in the workshop that that may allow them to do a little bit of thinking and understanding before they come into uh, the bow tie uh, workshop. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's absolutely right. And maybe just give an illustration of, of, of using the bow tie, which is something I did a, a couple of weeks ago. I was actually with a client, and the client, uh, while I was there, uh, um, came in uh, or arrived back from holiday after a, a week away. He then came in to me um, quite quickly and said, I've just arrived back and there has been an incident two days ago in my payments area. And he said, I've talked to the staff and I can't get a straight story and I've got all the bits of information I still don't understand. It appears that no one really understands what's, what's gone on. Can you help me to construct a bow tie? We immediately called the staff that had the knowledge into a room. We got the whiteboard and pen out and we started doing the analysis. In about 12 minutes, literally, the head of the department said, right, I now understand exactly what's gone on. Does everybody understand and get this? Let's go away and fix it. And he walked out with the full knowledge of what had happened. It was clear in his mind, and off he went to fix it. So one of the great benefits of the bow tie is simple clarity to sort out all of the things that can go wrong in an incident and how the whole thing really works. And I find that very powerful in terms of getting everybody that had snippets of information together so that we can work out the complete picture. So that is a very powerful technique. So once we've created the inherent risk bow tie, it then comes down to adding in controls. Now some people call these barriers, and you'll see the obvious reason why we call them barriers. It's what I tend to do then is for a particular risk, I start adding controls on. Now I potentially put them underneath the bow tie, but you can obviously put them anywhere. And here's some examples, and hopefully these are quite intuitive. The first one is flu jabs. 
So I tend to write them in another color to element to describe a control, and then I generally put an arrow to where it applies. Now some people will actually put a barrier on the connector between employee sickness and say lack of drivers, and uh, show it as a barrier stopping the risk flowing. I just put it as an arrow in this example, but this is just one illustration of how to do it. The second one is maintenance inspections on faulty headlights, inspections of rocks on tracks, rock guards, support drivers, guardrails, shift limits, public relations, and finally insurance. Now once we've added on controls, we've now got a true picture, or not a true, but we've got a very clear picture of the risk in its entirety. And it's made up of our causes, events, impacts, and our controls. Now we can start getting value out of using the bow tie for understanding better our controls. And what we generally find, and this is a generalization, is that controls that operate on the left hand side of the side of the bow tie towards the causes are preventive controls. Now why is it important to go back to root cause analysis? Because preventive controls generally apply to causes and the, uh, the cliche that we often use is prevention is better than cure is very true and I would like to generalize and say preventative controls are better than what we're going to talk about in a second, detective controls and they are also better than reactive controls. The controls that we tend to find then in the middle of the bow tie tend to be more detective type controls and this is where we might be monitoring the level of overtime work by the drivers. We therefore put shift limits in to stop them working more than a certain level of overtime. Now that would then be identifying where, where drivers are working excessive amount of hours and then putting a control in place to ensure that that is captured and we do not that allow that to progress any further through tiredness and so on. Now the controls on the right hand side, we generally refer to those as reactive controls. They're sometimes called responsive, uh, recovery, corrective controls, there's many words for that and they operate really at minimization of damage. Okay, so David, if you if we look at your uh, previous slide, so something I would like to highlight here is really the importance of uh, bow tie uh, analysis, uh, especially identifying uh, the left hand side of the events. Because what I have typically seen is that uh, risk management teams they focus on the event and the impacts, and they never really spend time on understanding the causes. But then they still go. Uh, they still have to go and implement the controls, and it becomes really difficult if you have to think about controls, especially to prevent that risk event. If you have not not done uh, the bow tie type of analysis, and you've not sort of expanded the left hand side of the bow tie, that uh, the the typical practice is that yeah, a lot of focus and time is spent on the actual event and the impact, and causes don't really get uh, as much uh, importance uh, in. Uh, understanding the risk uh, and that's where I've seen that you know uh, if you don't understand the causes then how do you really know whether uh, you have the right controls in place so so I think this diagram is really highlighting the importance of also uh, understanding the causes if you really want to understand uh, the risk so I, I don't know David if you want to add uh, any any comment on that uh, absolutely true and I guess uh, what we find often is that people that do not go back to the causes they tend to have what I call firefighting risk management and that's very reactive risk management and all they tend to be doing is managing incidents. Why? Because they haven't got ahead of themselves and you're absolutely right the reason is they have not traced back to the root causes and therefore they are not dealing with the risk until it's almost too late which is the main event has occurred and then we're obviously into firefighting. So I couldn't agree more with this, which is why the power of going to the left-hand side is absolutely critical, because this to me is where the best controls always are. So what I want to do now is, before we just move on, is to just draw a complete picture of risk, or what I call a complete picture of risk. Now if we think about any risk, we can always start off with today, exactly right now. Now if we think about a risk, right now it might not be happening, this is what I refer to as a bow tie, waiting to happen, a risk exposure. There's going to be a period of time between now and with when the risk cause begins. Now, if we were to do that, nothing's happening, then the cause happens, we have the bow tie, moving down to impact, and then we move over to recovery. If we think about that as our complete cycle of risk, we can now then add on controls. 
And preventative controls operate at the beginning of the bow tie to try and stop the bow tie from even starting in the first place. Detective controls operate somewhere in the middle. Now as a result of this we have what I refer to as early detective controls, which is controls prior to the main risk event. Then we have late detective controls, which is after the risk event has happened. And then finally we have reactive controls, which operate at the impact end, focused solely on reduction of impact. Now what's important here is in relation to the, the effect that preventative, detective and reactive controls have on the risk. Now as a general rule, we've got to think about when we do a risk assessment, and uh, typically when we do a risk control self-assessment, we will get people in a workshop and we'll start assessing the likelihood of impact of the risk, and we'll put that in the risk register and then we'll plot it on some kind of traffic light report, whether it's a 5 by 5 matrix. And if we think about what we're doing there, we are picking one point in the bow tie to assess likelihood and impact. Now you need to determine what that point is because the likelihood and impact of each part of the bow tie will be different. Now we suggest that what you are assessing is the centre of the bow tie being the main event. What this therefore means that as a general rule, everything happening on the left hand side of the bow tie is a likelihood driver. And what this highlights to us is that preventive controls are therefore primarily likelihood reducers. And early detective controls are also likelihood reducers. But once the event has now happened, it's all about impact. Therefore, late detective controls are impact reducers, as are reactive controls. Now, this to me is a very important piece of knowledge because quite often we see risk assessments done where someone calls out a control and then they will assess the impact the control has had on the inherent risk. Now, if the inherent risk using a five scale uh, level is a 4 4, they will often say the control has reduced it to a 2 2. Now I would argue this is actually quite rare because generally one control will only affect one point of the bow tie which is either before or after the main event which means a single control usually only reduces the likelihood or the impact and very rarely does it do both. As a result this is a time to challenge the assessor and go really? Does that really address both likelihood and impact and usually the answer once they've thought about it is actually no. Now using the bow tie to map the controls makes this a lot easier and as a general rule prior to the main event likelihood reducer, after the main event impact reducer. Okay, so so David, uh, a question here is uh, because we're talking about uh, the timeline uh, in, in terms of when the causes, event and impacts could happen, uh, have you seen uh, in bow ties uh, the space between the cause and the events uh, sort of reflecting the timeline that if there is a longer space between a cause and event then that sort of signifies that you know there may be a big time lag uh, between that cause and an event and if there's another cause and event where uh, the line between those is short then that reflects that that cause and event could happen pretty quickly with each other that have you seen the bow tie actually reflecting the amount of time it may take between a cause and an event or a interim event and a main event and so on? Um, yeah, I guess uh, another great question and uh, perhaps you know this is something for a discussion in another podcast but obviously what we're referring to here is moving into risk velocity and I'm not sure the extent of which risk velocity is considered in a wider audience but it's certainly something we as a firm uh, do uh, spend quite a lot of time on and obviously the concept of velocity is the speed at which something travels between two points. Now without getting too detailed here we could talk about the risk velocity of what we refer to as time to cause which is the period between today and when the cause first occurs, time to cause. We then have what we refer to as time to impact which is the time it takes to get from cause to impact which is how it travels through the bow tie and then finally we have time to recovery how long it takes to actually recover. Now in utilizing the bow's tie for this, it's all about time to impact, the period time it takes between cause and impact. Now in terms of using the bow tie for this, one of the principles is to change the space between the causes and events. The problem here is literally practical in that generally when we build a bow tie, what we build it on has got limited real estate. And as a result, the whiteboard is only so big and we're generally using trying to fit everything on. Now, one of the concepts that we've thought about, but it's the issue about understandability, is to start adding velocity into the elements of the bow tie. 
because what we can find, and as you're absolutely right, the time it takes to move from one part of the bow tie to the next can be different, and that truly reflects velocity. Now my view is this is all about maturity of risk management and I, I believe that uh, maybe it's something we start expanding in the future to develop this concept into bow ties. Uh, some of the audience have obviously been using velocity within the bow tie, I would love to hear from them, uh, but at this stage we certainly do it conceptually, but I haven't used the bow tie in terms of adding velocity on, but I do like the concept, but maybe that's a discussion for another time. Okay. Uh and uh, the second question is uh, in terms of the uh, the strength of the relationship that there may be two causes which may be linked to an event uh, in the bow tie. Uh, but if you want to signify that uh, cause one actually has a much stronger likelihood of that event happening or has a much stronger influence than cause two. Have you seen in the bow tie diagram that the line, you know, sort of where the relationship is uh, very influential. The line is a, a lot more thicker than another cause where the line may be relatively thinner to identify which one is the main uh, uh, cause and which one, you know, maybe uh, not the main cause. Uh, yes, absolutely, and I think you've already illustrated one way of doing that, which is the strength of the connecting lines, which I totally agree with that can be used. The other way that we've uh, used it is where we do not have uh, all the interim events uh, noted down, which is the third technique that I mentioned, is one way of doing this is to actually list the causes and the impacts in order of importance. So the top cause on the left would be the most important, followed by the second, followed by the third, and impact being the same. And that's often quite a simple way of doing it. The other way is obviously to start then uh, creating uh, parameters on each of the nodes of the bow tie by putting down likelihood scores and so on. And obviously the issue here is all about technical correctness versus user understandability. And what we often find is as much as you know, some of us who uh, you know, think about this in terms of development and the technical aspect, it's all very well in perhaps theory we've got to make sure what we're doing is fit for the audience and sometimes I can uh, start feeling that in workshops when we start getting too sophisticated we start losing the audience and that I think is a bigger risk than being technically correct. I do however like these principles but I think this is part of maturity going forward of how we can start expanding the use, use of the bow tie. So what I wanted to do is just mention then how we see the use of the bow tie and it can be used for many reasons. Number one is to identify and uh, expand and explore an incident and we see that being used a lot, root cause analysis, very powerful. The second one is to now start identifying future potential risks as part of the risk and control self-assessment and entering in the bow tie into the risk register. And uh, we again have mentioned that earlier uh, in terms of the way that might be entered into a risk register. The third method which I find very powerful is when we do scenario analysis, particularly stress testing scenario analysis. Now in stress testing scenario analysis we're obviously trying to create severe but plausible scenarios. And quite often I find it uh, uh, done by a client who will write out a story literally as um, um, a free form field describing the scenario. My only problem with that, it's not very visual and it's quite often hard to, far, to follow. If however you use the bow tie in creating that scenario from beginning to end, you can now enhance the scenario by each node of the bow tie, you can start linking to assumptions because each obviously stress scenario has an assumption and it's a great way to then document the assumptions at each stage of the bow tie to create, a, create the overall stress scenario. The third method or the third technique I like to use is to use the bow tie to identify key risk indicators. Now key risk indicators operate on the premise that when a risk develops it gives off evidence, red flag symptoms, puffs of smoke and the bow tie is a great way to get it in a workshop environment people to think about what would the evidence be for each node of the bow tie. So if we were to which I will come back in a second, talk about the train derailment, how would a key risk indicator fit with that? We would be looking for what evidence would be at each stage of the development and we can then add a potential KRI on. I find it very powerful for compliance risk, which is to understand why compliance breaches occur and what their impact could be. Now obviously we've got to think about what the centre of the bow ties with a compliance breach, 
but there's no reason why we can't use the bow tie for compliance breach incidents. Finally, I like it for visualisation. I am a very picture-based person and I would much prefer to see a diagram with colours on than I would to read a series of pros. So it's a great way to communicate uh, risk to a group of people or between two individuals. So let me just illustrate these very quickly. So in incident management, we literally get the group together that understands the incident and we map out the bow tie. Now this is just obviously a duplication of what we've just done, but we would map out exactly what has happened in terms of the risk. We would then identify the controls that were in place. This is exactly what we showed before, and this would be the incident, the, the incident occurring. Once we've done that, we would now ask ourselves what issues existed to allow this incident to occur, and from that we could then create actions to improve our control framework. Here are some examples. We might argue that maintenance inspections were found to have been missed, rock guards were broken, inspections were overdue, shift limits had been breached, and as a result we would then come up with actions to strengthen those broken controls. We might also then think what other controls might we have, and I've thought of one, maybe we might add in a new control which is to have track inspections after inclement weather on the basis that uh, more extreme weather such as uh, uh, freezing and thawing might loosen more rocks as might higher rainfall. So we've now used the bow tie for an actual incident that has occurred and tried to then learn from our past mistakes and it's a great way of communicating that. The second technique is to use it for risk control self-assessment. We've mentioned this before but we can now um, um, record this in a risk register together with the preventative controls, detective controls and reactive controls. And I just wanted to take the opportunity of using the bow tie to illustrate the importance of each type of control. As a generalisation, we always say prevention is better than cure. What this effectively means is that over a long period of time, we generally find that preventative controls are the most effective. It's much better to stop a risk in its tracks than let it go through and manage the fire at the end of the other end. Now, generally, over a longer period of time, the cost of preventative controls is the lowest yet their effectiveness is the highest. We then move on to detective controls. Their overall effectiveness tends to be medium, as in some of the risk has occurred, some damage might be being felt, but we have at least caught it before it's hit the major impacts. Now generally detective controls are around medium type cost. Finally we move to reactive controls. The, we now mentioned the horse is already bolted now, so we're in damage control. Now the effectiveness of reactive controls is therefore the lowest and generally the cost is the highest. An example I would give you is disaster recovery and so on. It's a very expensive control, yet also its overall impact might not be as good as if we'd have prevented the disaster in the first place. So this is then how we enter a risk into a risk register as part of the RCSA. The next one is scenario analysis. It's where we take the trained derailment and we go to an extreme but plausible level. So an example is, and I've narrowed down the bow tie to illustrate this for time, is we might not say rocks on, clap, on, on tracks, we say a cliff has collapsed. So it's an extreme version of the bow tie. We then make an assumption of what would be the most severe but plausible uh, size of cliff that has collapsed. And in a workshop, we might determine that a 300 meter section of the cliff could collapse, although very unlikely it's possible. That then leads to trains being crushed. Now obviously at a severe level we would be asking how many trains, how many carriages does the train has, what is the maximum capacity and worst time of the day, and we make our assumptions as two eight car carriage trains, it's rush hour and they are at full capacity. This leads then to passenger death and injury, it leads to compensation, and we could then have some kind of logical flow of how much compensation is to be paid based on the drivers of the risk. The train damage is reported in the press, global media coverage is the assumption, reputation damage, reduced revenue, regulatory breach, fines, giving us a total cost of 473 million. Now that is a severe but plausible scenario using the bow tie to illustrate what that is.
and I find this very powerful for number one to create a bow tie amongst a group of people in a workshop and secondly to document the bow tie together with the document the stress scenario sorry uh, with all of the drivers and the logic behind why we ended up with a 473 million dollar loss the fourth example is to use the bow tie for key risk indicators so what we are looking for here is as the bow tie develops what evidence does it give off and can we then pick up that evidence and use it as an early warning indicator I've given you some examples number one what about measuring the quantity of rainfall now obviously we've got to think about what is the strength of the indicator but here we have a causal relationship perhaps between the level of rainfall and the number of rocks that will be loosened from the cliff and roll onto the tracks we could also use one of the number of times the temperature has gone up below and above freezing on the principle that rain freezes in rocks expands and therefore perhaps creates greater uh, uh, rocks, uh, loose rocks now you can see here that expertise is required to understand the causal relationship and perhaps what we need on this risk assessment is a geologist we could also perhaps use the average age of headlight, headlights for using the causal relationship the older they get the more likely they are to fail the level of flu in the general public the number of drivers that we are short the level of staff overtime that's being worked now we're moving through the bow tie but we're picking up evidence that perhaps there is a problem starting to be created now we go to the right hand side of the bow tie the number of regulatory issues that are notified and finally the number of negative press articles that have uh, come out about the company now these are all potential key risk indicators we would have to analyze them as to their strength as to whether they are leading or lagging and whether it's worth uh, collecting these and using them in your risk management framework but I find the bow tie a great mapping tool to be able to identify good key risk indicators I did miss one sorry the number of damage incidents that have occurred which is obviously a very lagging indicator now one of the key elements about a key risk indicator is it leading or lagging how much time do we have between the indicator going off and an incident occurring now it's not the only thing that addresses leading and lagging but we can see from the bow tie that the indicators towards the left hand side of the bow tie are much more leading than the ones on the right hand side and this can help us evaluate whether an indicator is leading or lagging the additional items are that in key risk indicators we can also track the performance of controls now some of our clients refer to these as KCIs or key control indicators so we could put one on flu jabs and we could assess then the number of staff that have been flu jabbed the number of inspectors that have been carried out the number of shift limit breaches that have occurred and perhaps a ratio of dollars recovered by insurance to dollars lost now what we're doing here is trying to measure the performance of a control by tracking information that creates a key risk indicator or a key control indicator in terms of a compliance example we might have in the middle of the bow tie as a breach that should say of regulation apologies and we could then map it out as to why as the compliant breach occurred it may be and I won't repeat this too often just as an illustration unaware of requirements why lack of updates to the compliance library why a resource constraint why budgetary constraints and that budgetary constraint might have been handed down to the compliance department by a, a more senior person it therefore becomes the compliance department's cause it might simply be human error it might also be um, contributed to by change of legislation what happens next regulator is notified that could lead to fines loss of license reported in the press and reputation damage the final thing I wanted to mention the use of the bow tie is visualization one example might be along the lines of the typical 5x5 five five matrix that we might may be used to using now a lot of the 5x5 five five matrices that we use to assess the likelihood impact of risk use a dot or a circle to illustrate where the risk is perhaps one example is to use a bow tie instead and then depending on your software capabilities you might be able to click on the bow tie in this particular chart and then that opens up the actual bow tie behind it based on what we have just created and this would enable then a high level view of risk on the traditional 5x5 five five matrix together with the ability to drill down with greater uh, granularity and detail for each of those risks if we were requested perhaps in a risk meeting or a risk committee meeting 
Okay, so in conclusion, I just wanted to sum up what we see as the main value of the bow tie analysis. And I probably should also say maybe what some of the weaknesses are, because I don't want people thinking this is the solution to all risk problems. It is just one tool that we use that is useful in certain situations. Let's look at the value first. Number one, I find it a really good tool to get an understanding of risk and controls and being able to communicate that understanding to people across the organisation. Number two, understanding the why of risks and controls. We commonly find that when we ask individuals within an organisation who perhaps are a control owner, what is the control objective, why do you do the control, they would often answer because I was told to, or they'll answer it's in a procedures manual so it's part of my job. What we should get our staff to be able to do is to be able to articulate the risk to which the control relates and it would be fantastic if they were able to get a pen and a whiteboard and illustrate it through the bow tie. They could then show where the control is linked to the bow tie and as a result what the objective of the control is. Now one of the great powerful things of doing this is on the right hand side of the bow tie that shows the individual who owns the control and operates the control what will be the consequences if the control fails and it starts to create a more diligent view to the importance of carrying out controls and the consequences if I do not. Number three, I find it a really methodical analysis in terms of understanding the complex world of risk so that we can break it down into easier bite-sized pieces that can then be addressed one by one. Also, it's a great way to appreciate the upstream and downstream impacts and effects of our risk. Now, what we often do is create bow ties within a business unit. What we'll often find is the cause of risk in one business unit might be because of downstream impacts for another business unit. So what you can start doing is across a line of business, across many departments, you can start adding bow ties together and you now start seeing how risk truly flows from one department to another and it will often highlight, especially in organisations which look at risk in silos, business unit silos, they'll often find where risk is falling between departments because there is a gap between their bow ties. Number five, it's a very good tool in identifying key controls because it allows you to assess where the control is and exactly what it does to that pathway within the bow tie. It also assists in assessing the controls, particularly around does it reduce the likelihood and or the impact of the risk. It's really useful for identifying KRIs, as I mentioned before, and it's also very powerful in documenting scenarios. Finally, it's a really good tool, I believe, for reporting and communicating risk through the visualisation of risk. Now, just to temper what I've just said, we also should appreciate when we use the bow tie tool some of the limitations of the bow tie tool. So let me just mention a couple of limitations and it's very important that when we use it, we use it fit for purpose. We've raised some of these during the podcast but I want to just highlight them. One of them, it does not uh, very well identify the correlations between the different elements and the cause effect between the different elements. We did mention perhaps we can use thicker lines between the elements if they're highly correlated and there may be thinner lines for those that aren't correlated, but I don't think it is a wonderful tool because it can start getting quite complex when we start getting into those relationships. The second one, it does take a snapshot of the elements of, a, of risk. What it doesn't do, if we have multiple bow ties that themselves are cross-correlated, it doesn't show that extremely well because you are saying one bow tie on its own. So the interconnectedness between risk is not shown very well on the bow tie. So I guess in conclusion it does have its weaknesses but as long as the user and the uh, person that's receiving the bow tie reports understands the limitations of the bow tie technique, it can be very powerful. And I want to just maybe finish uh, uh, this was saying the most powerful part of the bow tie we find with our clients is that it engages with people across the whole of the business. We have one of our major banking clients here that three and a bit years ago didn't use the bow tie. I introduced the bow tie to them and they have pretty much mandated that all people across the whole bank will look at risk as way of bow ties and that they will discuss it with each other bow ties and it has now become part of their conversation. And a little while back, one of the people in the head office group risk function 
called me and said, I have to tell you a story that I heard two general managers of the bank the other day in a meeting and they were discussing risk and one said to the other, have you bow tied that? And it's become a noun and that's the level of integration they're having with bow tie analysis into the business and it's being used extensively across all lines of the business and becoming part of the day-to-day -day language. Okay, David. So if we can go to uh, the uh, the bow tie diagram we had created for the train derailment. So I, I just want to ask a couple of questions here. Uh, so my first uh, question is: Have you seen in the bow tie uh, the relationship being represented uh, between different risks? Uh, so, for example, if we had let's say one event uh, where we have a IT uh, outsourcing partner in India. Uh, and there was an event where uh, somebody introduced uh, some wrong code into our production environment due to which uh, the system was down for, let's say, half a day uh, in India. Uh, and then at the same time, in uh, London, the bank was uh, planning to run a marketing campaign where they were going to email the details about some new product as part of that campaign. And they needed to use that system, which was down in uh, which was down in India at the same time. So, so there are two sort of uh, separate events uh, uh, here. One event is uh, the the system going down in India. Another event is that we have to delay uh, this marketing campaign, or we may not be able to execute a marketing campaign on time. But there is, in this case, a, there may be a relationship because we want that IT system. Uh, to to execute a marketing campaign, uh, how how would you see that sort of two uh, different events or interrelated events uh, on bow tie? That would you create two separate bow ties and then create some sort of a linkage between uh, the main events? Um, there's probably a couple of ways I've seen this done. Uh, one is to include both parts of that situation into one single bow tie. So what that would effectively mean, in the middle you might have a system outage, for example, as your main event. And you would then uh, show that as uh, why has that been caused, uh, obviously by a code, by error and so on. So we would have that part. In addition, we would then have coming in from uh, 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 another part of the bow tie uh, the fact that a marketing campaign is happening and the two would then connect on the right hand side after the outage to connect with uh, a marketing campaign happening, system outage, they join and then uh, an event or maybe it's even the impact if I think about it is the marketing campaign failing and that would be on the right hand side of the main event and then that would obviously lead to I guess it could be opportunity loss, it could be increased cost to having to do the marketing campaign again so you can actually roll it up into one bow tie. The problem then becomes is the bow tie as I mentioned before becoming unwieldy and that's a call you have to make so that's one way of doing it. The other one is to create two separate bow ties and then the question becomes how do you interlink them now the, the main way I've seen this done is where we then have, uh, for want of a better word, a spider diagram. And I haven't got one on the presentation to show, but if we then were to take a clean sheet and we were to now put each bow tie on the sheet, maybe as a very small uh, icon, maybe similar to the one I had on the 5x5 five five matrix. Then we start drawing lines between the bow ties and the strength of the relationship or connectedness between them is, is um, done by the width of the line. Now, I'm not a fan of that because I don't find it overly intuitive, but that is one way to connect the bow ties together uh, that you've created. Now, in essence, I think that the ultimate answer to this is that the bow tie is not fantastic at doing this because it does uh, do a snapshot of certain elements of the risk and if you make it too big, it becomes to a degree unmanageable. So we're always looking for better ways of doing this and I'm always open to suggestions because I don't think we've got the perfect answer by far, uh, but I do think within the context of the bow tie, your question isn't that well addressed and it is perhaps one of the weaknesses of these cross correlations between different events. Okay. So uh, another question, uh, David, is uh, that when you identify, let's say, the causes on the left-hand side, and now because we are looking at uh, the future in terms of looking at uh, potential events which could happen in the future, uh, 
there is always a level of uncertainty in terms of uh, the causes that you may know a lot about. For example, the faulty uh, headlight cause because you know you've used that product for many years and you know that yeah they only uh, last for three years and then they start giving problems after three years. Uh, but you may not have uh, enough information on some of the other causes. Uh, so, so uh, how how do you how have you seen that level of uncertainty being mapped? That do we do we go in our risk register and go and say that okay for this cause, you know, we are sort of ninety nine percent sure we understand how and when it could occur, but on another cause, you know, our level of uh, uh, uncertainty is very high. So we probably have. 10, 20% knowledge about this cause, but there is a, a, a lot unknown and that unknown may be uh, for a genuine reason. That is, is that something you've seen uh, being captured as, as part of this analysis? Um, I have to say I haven't really seen that being captured on the bow tie, but I guess you know it opens up the uh, general concept of the degree of subjectivity, especially when we are assessing the likelihood and impact of a risk. And at the most subjective level, obviously, is the risk workshop where we, you know, take our experts from the business units in, and we sit there and we, you know, point our fingers in the air in terms of is it a one, two, three, four, or five, uh, using the uh, collective expert opinion uh, of the group. Now, obviously, that's quite subjective. Now, in the individual's head, they might be remembering their history, they might be thinking about how the world has changed, but to a degree, it's still subjective. We then move on to, I believe, where risk is developing to, is where we now start getting a better understanding of the drivers of likelihood and impact, of which the bow tie helps us. And once we get the drivers, what we can then start doing is trying to start progressively collecting more and more information about those drivers. So this is where we now start thinking about developing a more comprehensive key risk indicator process around the bow tie. So if we now start collecting information around the bow tie, that information might start getting us a little bit better understanding of the changing likelihood and the impact of the risk. If I give you an example of this, in a typical banking client of ours, obviously security risk of the branch, which is the retail branch, is critically important. So what we often find is that the group security team will do a likelihood impact assessment of, let's say, a branch hold up or a criminal attempt on a branch. Now, what they were starting to do is to develop that out to say, okay, what are the drivers of likelihood and why don't we start collecting parameters and indicators around the likelihood so that when we go and do our assessment, we have something to be a little bit more objective on. So they will be collecting things like the changing population uh, around that particular uh, retail branch. Uh, what are the number of incidents that have occurred? And really talking about the demographic and how that demographic is changing. Um, and as a result, they then create uh, more predictors of the likelihood based on as much information as they can get. Now, it's probably outside the scope of the, the podcast to discuss this too far, but obviously I see one of the futures of risk management is then moving into the uh, big data uh, uh, concept. Now, what that really means to me is that as we look at the bow tie and look at pieces of evidence about the uh, elements of the bow tie and what's happening at each node, we actually have a huge amount of information that's potentially available. If we can tap into that and, and, and capture that from all unstructured sources in a, in, in a big data environment and then have analytical tools over it to be able to convert that into something more meaningful, I then think we've got a better chance of moving away from perhaps quite the level of subjectivity that we've got at the moment to something that's perhaps more are quantifiable. Uh, that said, we've always got to remember that risk relates to the future and I for one cannot see into the future. So regardless of what we end up doing, there's always going to be an element of subjectivity and modelling um, that may be incorrect and assumptions because at the end of the day, risk relates to the future and unless we can see directly into the future, then we're never going to have an exact science around this. And I, for one, if I could see into the future, I probably wouldn't be doing risk management. I'd probably be visiting the casino or a horse race more often. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and then maybe the last question uh, from my side uh, is, uh, where where is technology uh, in, in all of this? Uh, uh, and I ask the technology aspect from two perspectives. So, uh, if we are working, let's say, in a large global organization where uh, 
uh, the people uh, or, or the places where the event would happen are, are a different geographic location to where the causes could happen uh, and where the impacts could happen, then you, in large global complex organization, you know, it may not be possible to bring physically people together. So uh, is the is the technology already out there, or, or, or should I, you know, just open a PowerPoint slide uh, on a WebEx session and then I draw all this on a PowerPoint slide, or are there technology solutions where we could create the bow tie in collaboration with the team in that type of an online session? Uh, but then the second aspect is that once I do that. Uh, I uh, my risk register automatically gets populated based on what I have captured in that online session. I don't want to, you know, capture it on Excel and PowerPoint, and then somebody after the session has to go and type all that uh, into my uh, risk register. So, w w where do you see technology in sort of being able to facilitate that sort of online brainstorming and uh, creation of bow ties? but then also converting these nice pretty diagrams into actual information uh, so that you can you know, take this information and then start uh, doing your assessments and start thinking about your controls and KRIs and so on. Um, yeah, no, it's a very good question. And as much as this stage, I haven't mentioned uh, much about what we, what I'm involved with with my firm, uh, Protech, which I'd like to maybe make a couple of comments at the end. Uh, one of the things we are involved in is uh, is uh, software development, and we have a product called uh, Protech ERM, uh, which looks after all of the typical risk management elements that uh, you'll be familiar with. Now, one of the issues is obviously technology around the bow tie. Um, if we start off with a simple level, which we've discussed, is a very version called a whiteboard and a pen. Um, the second version is very useful which is sticky labels. Now obviously all of these suffer from the ability not to be able to collaborate remotely. So if we move forward then we can start using things like PowerPoint which is quite useful, a little bit clunky. We can use Excel and then we can start using mind maps and I find mind maps really quite powerful to be able to do this because it lends itself to this kind of analysis. Now in terms of mind maps, obviously there you can start using collaboration remotely because a lot of these mind maps obviously are uh, uh, cloudware and uh, you can start collaborating in that way. In addition, I am aware of specific bow tie tools that are out there. Um, I have not used any specifically myself, but for us as a firm, yes, we are looking down this direction in terms of uh, a typical uh, uh, you know, bow tie mind map type approach. And our approach ultimately is the development of a bow tie um, such as you see on the screen, and then the ability to save. And when that's saved, it will then drop all the components into the main ERM system as a typical risk register, and it will save the, uh, the bow tie uh, in the diagram way that we've said. And obviously, we are looking very much at the user interface in terms of click and drag, like a typical bow tie does. Uh, and that's, we believe, the way of the future, which would allow, uh, number one, visualization, number two, collaboration remotely, and number three, the ability uh, to drop into your overall risk system all the details that you've created rather than having to re-enter again. So I believe it's quite an exciting area of development here and I think the bow tie lends itself very much to uh, the technology that is currently available. So, so you think, David, then there is still some work to be done sort of in the industry where maybe uh, the bow tie tools uh, which uh, facilitate all this visual visualization are still separate than maybe the risk management uh, technology uh, the organization may be using. Uh, and, and, and that's where the work is still remaining because ideally you would want the bow tie functionality into your risk management software itself so that you can, you know, uh, create all these nice visuals. But then, you know, uh, as soon as you uh, hit on uh, uh, add to the risk register button, all those diagrams then convert, get converted to the respective objects uh, with as causes or risks or impacts and you don't have to go and retype. So you, you're saying from an industry perspective that is still work in progress that there is there is still not a risk management tool which already has the bow tie visualization sort of embedded into it from from what you know? 
Um, obviously, uh, my population size is not huge given that um, uh, uh, I have not got great visualization of our competitors for obvious reasons, so um, I can't really speak for all software globally. So I may be wrong, and there may be pieces of software that already do exactly what you are saying. I'm personally not aware of them. Uh, let's assume there isn't exactly what you did. I believe that is the way of the future uh, because I think the user interface with risk management systems is an area for uh, development, and uh, I believe as you quite rightly said, the user wants to create pictures not dissimilar to the bow tie and then the ability to automatically drop that in. So certainly as a firm, uh, that is an area we are absolutely working on um, and if other you know, software providers are doing something similar then I think you're absolutely right, this is an area of development that we will see developing over the next 6-12 months and so. Okay, great. Yeah, so we can maybe uh, appeal to uh, the listeners that if uh, you, if the listeners have seen uh, any software, any risk management software, which also has you know a the bow tie functionality sort of embedded in, uh, then maybe you can post uh, that into the comments uh, of uh, area of this podcast, uh, so we can we can see whether you know that that challenge has already been uh, addressed. Uh, but yeah, David, when uh, maybe when you get to that stage where you have something to share. Uh, with our listeners uh, on on the development you talked about, you know, it'll be great uh, for you to come back and share that uh, because I think that's that's a very uh, very significant gap uh, I've seen, you know, with the risk management technology that, uh, or it's it's one sort of hindrance in terms of using the bow tie analysis that you do collect a lot of good information, but then not all that good information ends up into your risk register. Uh, and anything which can be done to make that easy will only make uh, uh, the appeal of using bow tie, you know, sort of a no-brainer, you know, which is what it should be. That you know, there should be no uh, risk uh, identification, which should be done, you know, without uh, the bow tie analysis. Uh, and then maybe we need to just cross sort of that one hurdle to to make that uh, make that possible. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. So it's something that I'm I'm certainly excited about from us as a firm. Okay, so it's time to close our session today. Thank you, David, for sharing content about the bowtie analysis technique with our audience today. You shared many practical examples, which is what we encourage in our discussion with expert speakers. So our audience can not only become familiar with the useful risk management concepts we discuss, but also they are able to apply these in real world. If any of the listeners want to contact David directly, please use the details on the screen to get in touch with him.